What's up, guys? Oh, I'm gonna get a big Thank you, dudes, for responding. Ladies, you're late. Um, so, have y'all ever made a promise before? Yeah. What, what are some of the promises y'all make? Uh, yes. The only one we made. I made a promise to my brother that I would play my game concert with him. Oh, nice. Like an hour straight. Oh, an hour straight. What else? Uh, both Carson. It's Carson. Yeah. I promised. I will not, I will not eat my food weird like I always do. You're not your food weird, I like it. Carson, I pull it. I promised my friend that I wouldn't tell his butt face further than that. Like, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like Sadie Ferguson in here, Carson does not keep promises. What about the girls? What kind of promises have y'all kept? Um, you promised your brother you wouldn't tell. You promised your brother you wouldn't tell. Ooh, oh, I hear that. That's a different conversation. Okay, Gabby, we'll go to the last one. Well, Mr. Brother, that you would play baseball with. So, all of us have played drums before, right? Yeah. So, I remember last year for the kids' Christmas party. Corey probably has a room for this. He probably does, because Corey knows everything. I, was, I went to the gym and I saw a volunteer who volunteers here at the church with us. And they go, Tucker, you don't have to be at the church tonight? And I'm thinking, it's a Friday. Why would I be at the church? And I said that. And they go, with a kid's Christmas party. And they go, oh, junk. I promised Corey I would be at the kid's Christmas party. It's almost 8 o'clock. I'm not there. So I promised Corey I would be there, but I didn't keep that promise. So the flip side of that is, how many of us make promises but actually so if you play with your brother, your dangerous hut game, whatever it was for an hour, um, they didn't tell your friends that his friend was saying Ferguson, did you play baseball with him? See, that's a different question, isn't it? Because we can make promises all day, right? Like I promise I will take out the trash, right? I promise I'll clean the dishes. How many of y'all actually have to clean the dishes? Good. Your parents are basically right. Not cleaning them, taking them. Take them out. Oh my gosh. Who does who who has a dishwasher in here? I don't. My house doesn't have a dishwasher. Your parents are not raising out here. Yeah. So how many of y'all have to take out the trash? How many of y'all promise to clean up after your dog when your dog comes and makes a mess? I don't have a dog. Okay. I don't have a dog. Here's a good illustration I love to make. How many of y'all have had a fish before? How many of y'all said, I promise I'll feed the fish. Two weeks later, the fish is dead. I jumped on the trampoline. Oh, the fish ate the fish. I jumped on the trampoline. That's the fish. Fair point. That's the fish. To me. But, um, oh, yeah. Maybe my dad just came out. Perfect. There you go. I can hear myself. So, we, Carson, we make a lot of promises, and sometimes, we don't keep them. And the Bible has a great, has a lot of conversations, a lot of stories about promises. It teaches a lot about promises. So we're actually going to continue looking at this guy named David. And last week we saw that David and Jonathan were best friends, right? So they were the bestest of friends. But who was Jonathan's dad? Saul, right? And what was Saul trying to do today? Kill him, execute him, murder him. Because King Saul was jealous. He didn't like that. So a rational decision was like, I'm king, I'm going to kill you. So what did Jonathan do for David? They, he saved him, right? So Jonathan and David made this promise to each other. Do you remember what uh, the fancy church word that we um, that we uh, that we said a promise was, Tyler? A covenant, right? And we explain that a covenant is just a fancy word for a promise. So we're going to pick up in David and Jonathan's story a little bit later on in life. And where we are, um, Jonathan is actually dead. So he's died of old age, whatever it was. King Saul is actually dead now, too. So Jonathan and Saul are out of the picture. So in that, who's now king? 
and David, right? So David was now king. And I don't know if you know anything about biblical times or ancient times when a new king came into uh, came into power. But um, when a new king came into order, you know what they would do with the previous king's family? Kill them. Kill them. Carson's like, oh, Carson's a prophet. No, they would kill them. They would execute them. Murder them. Because that's ancient times. Seems kind of crazy now, right? But David is now king. And a normal king's thought would be, hey, I'm going to kill these people. Anybody left of Saul's family, they're gone. They're nicks. I'm going to get my people and be executed, right? So we're going to be in 2 Samuel, verse 9. And David's now king. And um, listen to what David says. David asks, is there anyone left from the royal house of Saul? So, fancy way of saying, is anybody of Saul's family still here? I'm king now. I want to know if anybody else is, uh, anybody else of Saul's kin, or kinfolk, the family, the relative, is still here. If there is, and David's a warrior. You gotta remember that. David beat the lion, right? He cut off the giant's head. It was a miraculous. He said, if there is, I want to be kind of it. See, this is very countercultural to what a king would say. David says, if there's anybody left of Saul's family, I want to be kind of them. I want to be kind of them because of who? Because of Jonathan. But why because of Jonathan? Tyler? Because they made a promise to be always be kind to each other. Because they made that promise. King Saul, he knew what kings did, or King David, he knew what King Saul did with the previous family. He knew what kings did with families. They were killed, they were missed, they were gone. But David decided to turn the page. He decided to turn the script. And he said, If there's anybody left of King Saul's family, bring them to me. I want to be kind to them. So we keep reading. It is, it says, Zippo was a servant of Saul's family. David sent for him to come and see him. The king said to him, Are you Zippo? I guess that's how he said. The king asked, Is there anyone still alive from the royal house of Saul? God has been very kind to me, and I'd like to be kind to that person in the same way. Zippo answered to the king, A son of God that's still living. Both of his feet were hurt, so he can't walk. Where is he? The king asked. He's in the town of. Oh, gosh. Um, so, Jonathan's son is still here. And if you know anything about family, Jonathan's son is King Saul's grandson. So, there's still somebody left of King Saul's family. So, King David is like, dude, let's go find this guy. Let's go reach out to him. Let's go find who he is. And his servant's like, okay, here he is. He was town he's in. He can't walk, so we have to go find him. So we pick up in verse 6. And it says this. Oh, gosh. I had the name memorized right before this. Mephibosheth. 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 Mephibosheth came to David. He was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. You got to think about what's going through Mephibosheth's mind in this moment. He knows that his granddad's gone. He knows that King David is now king. So what do you think Mephibosheth is thinking? Is thinking that David's going to do? Kill him. Kill him. Like, dude, if I was him, I'd be terrified. Like, this brother's going to see me. This is how I feel now. I'm not going to report of this. Oh, goodness. Here we go. So it says in verse 6. He was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Mephibosheth bowed down to David to show him respect. David said, Mephibosheth, I'm ready to serve you. And look at what he says in verse 7. Don't be afraid, David told him. You can be sure that I'll be kind to you. Because of who? Your father. Your father who? Jonathan. David was kind to Mephibosheth because of Jonathan. 
because of the promise that God has made. I'll give back to you all the land that belongs to your grandfather Saul. I'll always provide what you need. And Zibosheth is confused at this point. Again, the dude, I thought this guy was going to kill me. I thought I was gone. But now David said, hey, I'll give you all the land that was back to my grandfather's. And he said, I'll give you everything that you'll need. Mephibosheth bowed down to David, verse 8. Who am I? I? Why should you pay attention to me? I'm nothing but a dead dog. But we skip down to verse um, verse 11. It says, Then Ziba said to the king, I'll do anything you command me to. You're my king and master. So David provided what Mephibosheth needed. He treated him like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth, who is this person that normally would get killed, would be in exile, would be executed, or whatever, is now brought into King David's royal palace, essentially. It says he was treated like a son. See, and you gotta think, like, you gotta think of how the nation of Israel would think to this. It's like, dude, David, you are bringing essentially an enemy, someone who is against you, into your family. Because you know why people were, would execute former kings' uh, families? They wouldn't turn against them. That's exactly right. People were scared of rebellion. People were scared that they would go against them, that they would fight against the new king. So people were like, David, what are you doing? Dude, you're bringing this person who can start a rebellion. You can bring this person who can start a riot into your palace. See, because David knew this. David knew the promise that he made was going to make. And David knew that he was going to keep the promise that he made was going to make. Even if it costed him something. See, David, in his home, invited Mephibosheth to his table. Mephibosheth could have been an outcast. He could have been someone who started a riot, started a rebellion, whatever it is, right? But he invited him to have a seat at his table. David wanted to communicate to Mephibosheth, hey dude, I care about you, I value you, I want you to see how much I value you as a person, so come to my table. Come have a seat at my table. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what it would cost me. Dude, I'll even give back all the land that was your grandpa. I don't care about that. I care about you. David had a promise to know that. And he kept that promise to be kind, to honor the promise that he made with Jonathan years and years before. Dude, no one was there to keep David accountable for that promise. Jonathan's gone. Saul's gone. Dude, he could have ended with Mephibosheth right there and then. But he decided to honor. Because he knew that God knew the promise, knew the covenant that he made with Jonathan. Jonathan. So he was going to honor that promise. To be covered, even if it costs it something. Okay, so that's a cool story, Tucker, but what does that, what does that have to do with anything about me? Dude, there may be someone at your school that you need to invite to your table, that you need to be kind to. Now, I like the illustration of the group project. So imagine you're in a group project. Who do you want to pick? Like, who are the people that you want to pick for a group project? Your friends. Your friends, right? For me, it'd be the smart kids. It'd be the people who do all the Right? Who else is there? Like, it's okay, raise your hand. There's no pen across the thing. Oh, that's stupid. Why would you not pick the smart kids? See, we pick, pick the smart kids, we pick our friends, because that doesn't cost us anything. But instead, what about the kid that never is included? The student that doesn't have many friends. The student who sits by himself at lunch, by herself at lunch. We rather include our friends than include someone who doesn't have friends. See, yeah, we may not have this group project with our friends, but if we invited that person that's not really in that community, not really in those friendships, and we invited them to have a seat at our table, dude, we can love them. We can be kind to them. And here's the crazy thing. 
just like David invited Mephibosheth to, to his table and showed how valuable he was to David, if you can show how valuable someone is by inviting them to your table. At lunch, dude, I told the junior high students, dude, be in the church and start at your lunch table. And I don't want you to say any names, but you're probably thinking of somebody who sits by themselves at lunch. You see them, and you're like, uh, they're by themselves, so I don't really want to hang out with them. Dude, invite them to your table. Invite them to come sit with you. Say, I, I know you may be alone in this moment, but dude, I want to invite you to our table. I want to be kind to you. For some, it may be taking someone who's not that good at sports before your friends so they can be on your team and not be the last pick every single time. For some, it is to invite them to play video games before service. For some, it's to invite them over to your house because they never get invited to somebody's house and they feel so alone. And you can probably think of somebody. You can probably think of those people. Because you guys are fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. You're starting to see that. Your God has shown kindness to us. Just like God showed kindness to David. See, that's the reason David kept his promise to Jonathan. Not because he felt his life, but because he knew that God was kind to him, so he was going to be kind to Mephibosheth. God has been kind to us. Dude, we got to be kind to people. Even if it costs us something. If it's the unpopular thing to do. If it means we don't spend as much time with our friends. So as we go to the small group, I want you to I want you to think of this. Why do promises matter so much? Because we live in a world that promises are broken daily. Right? That promises are broken, that trusts are broken. But why do promises matter so much? Because I, I believe that promises matter so much is because you show that you honor that person. And I, I believe we have a promise by God that He is faithful to us, that we need to be faithful to Him. And that may be doing uncomfortable things, like inviting someone we're not really friends. Uh, to our table, by picking someone first, by inviting them to our home. But if we gotta honor them, show that we care about them, show that we value them as people, because God has done the exact same thing for us. And as Christians, followers of Christ, we gotta go through this process. Let me pray for you guys. I know we're gonna be able to. God, we love you. We thank you that you've been good to us, God. God, I pray that we're just, that we're stewards of your love, God, that we show people the love that you've given us. And God, I pray that we understand the power of promises, God, and the importance of promises. God, I pray that we honor you, and that we honor the calling that you place on our lives to make disciples and make disciples. To all the nations baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit, God. God, in some of our nations, some of our tables, God, they're at lunch. They're in our friends group. They're at school. They're on our team. God, I pray that we invite someone to our table. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus.